Hello, and welcome to a new module on derivatives. Today, we will tackle optimization problems by applying the criteria of the first and second derivatives that we have previously covered. The prerequisites include an understanding of derivatives of elementary functions, as well as a clear grasp of both the first and second derivative criteria. To know what is an extremum of a function, growth or decay, the basic mathematical operations. It might sound like a lot, but these requirements are quite manageable. Let's begin by devising a strategy for tackling maximum and minimum problems. The initial step which we are going to start with is always to identify all the known quantities and the quantities to be determined in the problem we are dealing with. In the next stage, you should identify or record the primary function that you want to maximize or minimize. What does this entail? It means you should determine which function you need to maximize and which one you need to minimize. This is crucial in the task of solving optimization problems. Subsequently, you must identify and document any secondary equations, which relate the main variable to the other variables you might be using. Next, our task is to express the primary function as a single variable function. This step is of utmost importance, and it underscores the significance of both the primary function and the secondary equation. Through the secondary equation, we establish the relationship enabling us to perform substitutions and integrate all the relevant information into the primary function. In the fifth step, it's crucial to establish the domain of the primary function, determining both where it's defined and the specific values pertinent to your problem. Following this, employ the techniques we've discussed, including setting the derivative to zero and utilizing the first and second derivative criteria. These methods will allow you to effectively locate the function's maximum and minimum values. Let's see an example. A very classic and very easy one to start with. A manufacturer aims to create an open box with a square base and a surface area of 108 square centimeters. What dimensions will yield the maximum volume for the box? Despite its appearance, the base is indeed square. Have you observed that this is precisely what the statement conveys? This is of great significance. We're dealing with a square base, and I've denoted the side of the base as x. Despite the somewhat distorted appearance in this perspective, both sides of the base are indeed x, and they are equal. I've assigned the variable h to represent the height of the box. The term open box implies that there is no top lid. It consists only of the base and the sides, without a lid. With a square base and a total area of 108, let's delve into the implications. What are the dimensions that yield the maximum volume for this box? The concept here is that you can create various boxes. A box with a small square base but considerable height, or a large box with a square base and minimal height. The question is, where does it maximize volume? Which box offers the most space? What dimensions should the box possess to achieve maximum volume? Let's begin. What is the primary objective here? What are we aiming to maximize? The task is to maximize the volume. So, what dimensions will result in the box having the maximum volume? The volume function is calculated by multiplying the base area by the height. In this scenario, the base area is a square, and you're likely aware that the area of a square is determined by side multiplied by side. So it would be, given that we've designated one side as x, the area of the square base is x squared, and it's multiplied by the height, denoted as h on the graph provided. The area of the base, which is x times x, is combined with the height h to calculate the volume. Therefore, we've already established the volume. What else is required? We have the primary function, which is the volume function, our target for maximization. Now let's turn our attention to the secondary equation. There should be an equation that elucidates the relationship between these variables. Why? Primarily because we are dealing with straightforward problems. Also, because we don't yet know how to work with functions of several variables. This is a function with multiple variables. It relies on both the side of the box and the height, specifically on two variables, x and h. At this point, you do not know how to calculate maxima and minima for functions with several variables you will acquire new techniques during the first years of your degree. However, for now, you are only equipped to maximize functions with a single variable. Consequently, we need to eliminate one of these variables. It should not be x squared times h, but rather x squared multiplied by something that is dependent on h as well. The relationship necessary to express the function solely in terms of x is provided by the secondary equation. So where can we find it? Let's locate it. We are aware that the total area is 108 square centimeters, but it's essential to note that this isn't solely the base area. It encompasses the entire box's surface area. In other words, it comprises the base area as well as the combined area of the four sides. 
How can we express this? I will denote the total box area as S. I'm aware that this area is the sum of the base area and four times the area of a single side of the box as all the sides are identical. Remember, since the base is square, the size of all four sides remains the same. How much is the area of the base? If the side of the box is worth x, the area of the base is x squared. And how much is the area of one side of the box worth? It's side by side again, it would be x times h. Since there are 4, it would be 4 times x times h. We come back here. In this case, it would simply be x squared, which is the area of the base, plus 4 times x times h, which is 4 times the area of one side of the box. I've been given the task of achieving a sum total of 108. To accomplish this, I've got a relatively simple equation. x squared plus 4h times x equals 108. This is the secondary equation. Primary function, uh, the volume, the one that we want to maximize. Secondary equation, the one that gives us the relationship between the two variables. It's this one. Notice that both variables are involved, and it is also equated to a number. It may sound unusual to phrase it this way, but I want you to be able to distinguish when it's a primary function and when it's a secondary one. It is an equation that has several variables and is equal to a number. This is how you will recognize when it is the secondary equation. The primary function is simply the primary function. Volume is this function, but we've not been told that the volume has to be a specific number. We have to maximize it. Primary function. And here we have x squared plus 4xh equals 108. Secondary equation. What are we going to do? We're going to solve for h from this equation. And that's very straightforward. Subtracting the x squared from both sides and dividing by 4x. A quick note here. Can we divide by 4x in any case? Be cautious. We can't do it when x might be equal to 0. We would need to handle that case separately. However, consider this. We are dealing with the dimensions of a box where x represents the length of a side. Do you think it's possible for a side to be 0? No, because in that case, we wouldn't have any area. This is what I mentioned here. Now we substitute. Once we have h successfully isolated in this equation, it's a simple process. What I'm going to do next is substitute it into the volume function. Let's proceed. In this scenario, I would have the volume, which was previously represented as x squared times h. Now it will be x squared multiplied by this revised expression, 108 minus x squared divided by 4x. Can we simplify anything further? Indeed, we can. As you can see, there's an x in the denominator and x squared in the numerator. We can simplify one of the x terms. This leaves us with x times 108 minus x squared divided by 4. If we divide the fraction into two separate parts and then multiply the entire equation by x, we obtain 27x minus 4x cubed. You see, it's just a matter of breaking down the fraction. 108 divided by 4 equals 27, and subtracting x squared divided by 4. Then, when you multiply everything by x, you end up with 27x minus x cubed divided by 4. I emphasize that these are simplifications that I hope you've mastered thoroughly. Now let's calculate the critical values, the critical of the volume function. What we've reached is quite simple. Deriving this is a simple process. The derivative of 27x is 27, and the derivative of x cubed divided by 4 is 3 quarters. The 3 comes down, and the 4 remains the same, of x squared. It's an easy calculation. Now, we set this equal to 0 and solve. Here. The result will be pleasing, but you can solve it without any issues. 27 minus 3 quarters times x squared equals 0 can be rewritten as 27 equals 3 fourths of x squared. To simplify this equation, we add the negative 3 quarters of x squared to both sides of the equation, resulting in the following expression. The 4 will be multiplied to the other side, and the 3 will be divided to the other side in a two-step process. This leads to the following. 108 equals 3x squared. When we divide by 3, we are left with x squared equals 36, as 108 divided by 3 equals 36. As we all know, the square root of 36 is 6, which gives us two possible solutions, one negative and the other positive. x equals plus 6, or x equals minus 6. However, in the context of this practical problem, a side length of minus 6 centimeters doesn't make sense. Therefore, we should disregard the negative solution and focus solely on the positive solution, considering that we are working on a problem where only positive solutions are relevant. Therefore, we have just one critical point, which is when x equals 6. How are we going to classify whether it is maximum or minimum? How are we going to determine if the volume is maximum or minimum at that point? 
We use the second derivative test. Do you recall it? I need to calculate the second derivative and then substitute the critical point into that second derivative. If the result is positive, it indicates a minimum, while if it's negative, it indicates a maximum. Let's go through the process. We calculate the second derivative, which is easy since the first derivative was a polynomial. Remember, the first derivative was a polynomial. Consequently, 27 disappears, the 2 is brought down as a multiplier, and it simplifies with the 4 in the denominator, leaving us with minus 3 halves of x. Let's revisit this. We have minus 3 halves of x. Substituting 6 for x, we get minus 9. The second derivative at 6, the critical point, is minus 9, which is negative. What does this signify? It means that the function has a maximum at x equals 6. The volume reaches its maximum at 6. Now, for the volume value, you'd need to recall the value of h. I've broken this down into two steps. If x is equal to 6, and since h is determined as a function of x, I've gone back and used the expression for h as a function of x, replacing x with 6. This yields h equal to 3. When x equals 6, h is equal to 3. Thus, the value of the maximum volume is obtained by multiplying 6 squared by 3, resulting in 108 cubic centimeters. I trust that the process is now clear. Let me reiterate the final step. When x equals 6, it's evident that the volume function reaches its maximum. However, that's only the x value. What we truly need to determine is the maximum volume. To do that, I refer back to the h that I had previously determined. And by substituting the value of x into that h, I determine its worth. The volume is calculated as x squared times h. As I have both values, I multiply them, resulting in a maximum volume of 108 cubic centimeters. Let's consider another example, a common one in mathematical analysis, involving the determination of the minimum distance between a mathematical function and a specific point. In this scenario, our graph represents the function y equals 4 minus x squared, a classic quadratic equation. Our goal is to identify the specific points on this curve that are closest to the point 0, 2. To start, what information do we have? We're dealing with a downward-facing parabola. We will represent it in a moment. The given point 0, 2 does not lie on the graph. When I substitute 0 for x, y yields 4, not 2. Therefore, it is possible to conclude that this point is not part of the function's graph. The distance between two points, one being x, y, and the other 0 and 2, is calculated using this expression, the square root of x minus 0 squared plus y minus 2 squared. Essentially, what we need to determine is the magnitude of the vector that connects the point x, y to the point 0, 2. Therefore, we have this straightforward expression for the distance between two points. This is the function that we need to minimize, which we refer to as the primary function. We aim to minimize the distance, making it as small as possible. So, we have the primary function. Now, we need to find the secondary equation that relates x and y. In this case, it's quite simple because it's provided in the statement y is equal to 4 minus x squared. As we're taking points from the graph, for each value of x, y follows this expression. Therefore, we already have the secondary equation, which is 4 minus x squared. If we substitute y with this expression, we get the following function. Please note that the only change is replacing y with 4 minus x squared. Plugging it in, we get x squared plus 2 minus x squared. As you can see, the 4 and the minus 2 cancel out, leaving us with just 2. The only modification is the substitution of y with the expression obtained here. We now have the distance expressed as a function of x. But what's next? Of course, we must calculate the maxima and minima. To do that, we'll need to differentiate, set the derivative equal to 0, and solve. However, keep in mind that we're dealing with a square root. Do you know how to differentiate a square root? It's 1 divided by 2 times the square root, then multiplied by the derivative of the inner function. Indeed, the derivative can be quite complex in this case. What can we do? To find the minimum of the distance function, we can focus on the inside of the square root without concerning ourselves with the square root itself. We'll work with this inner function, which I've given the name f of x, representing what was inside the square root. It's easy to differentiate because this is a polynomial. The first derivative is 2x plus 2 times 2 minus x squared times 2x, the derivative of the inner function. The exponent descends, the inner function remains unaltered. We subtract 1 from the exponent and then multiply by the derivative of the inner function. You simplify this expression, which is a straightforward process, and you obtain 4x cubed minus 6x. Setting it equal to 0, we factor out the common factor of x to simplify the equation. 
this results in two solutions. Either x equals 0, or this expression equals 0, leading to the equation 4x squared minus 6 equals 0. By moving the minus 6 to the other side, we obtain x equals plus or minus the square root of 6 over 4, which is equivalent to plus or minus the square root of 3 over 2. I understand it may seem complex, but we'll continue working with it. What we've done is differentiate the function that was inside the distance function. We then set it equal to 0 and solved, resulting in three critical points. 0 plus the square root of 3 over 2 and minus the square root of 3 over 2. Now how do we classify these critical points? By applying the second derivative test, which involves taking the second derivative of the function, substituting the critical points, and checking whether it yields a positive value, indicating a minimum, or a negative value, indicating a maximum. The second derivative is straightforward, so I present it in a tabular form. The critical values are minus the square root of 3 over 2, 0, and the square root of 3 over 2. My apologies for the notation error. These are not first derivatives, they all are second derivatives. I substitute the critical values into the second derivative and the results are positive, negative, positive. The last one is positive, not negative. My apologies for the two previous errors. They are indeed all second derivatives. So, the correct classification would be minimum, maximum and lastly minimum. The conclusion is correct, but there were no 13 errors. Please double check and verify this calmly. Therefore, the closest points are those reached at negative square root of 3 halves and positive square root of 3 halves. What's the y value in those cases? It's the distance at the negative square root of 3 halves and positive square root of 3 halves. The important thing to note is that at negative square root of 3 halves, it's a minimum, and at positive square root of 3 halves, it's a maximum. So the nearest points are these two, indicated right here. Graphically, consider the function as an inverted parabola. Approximately here is where you'll find minus the square root of 3 over 2, and around here is the square root of 3 over 2. These two points are the closest to this point here, the one at 0, 2. This point here is the nearest to 0, 2, and it happens to be a relative maximum. It's a relative maximum because it's not the value farthest from the point 0, 2. I hope this information helps. If you need more practice problems or have any questions, please let us know. Thank you for your attention.